been a long day, but a, a long, uh, extraordinarily wonderful day, uh, I, at, least, at least from my perspective. Um, for, for me, it's been amazingly gratifying. I've been part of uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace with Steve Killay almost from its inception. When he first got started, we met in Washington. And uh, at first, I had no idea what this guy was talking about. And it didn't take long to figure out that it was pretty darn good. And I, I took it to the board. I was uh, uh, president of the Alliance for Peace Building at the time and reported back to the board about my meeting with him, and they were totally skeptical. In fact, they really didn't want me to have anything to do with it. And I really had to persuade them that this was something to say, at least let's give it a try. We gave it a try. It's been one of the best things that ever happened to the entire peace building field, and certainly we now have a very strong relationship uh, between the, the Institute, Alliance for Peace Building, and the entire peace building community. So, and to come here and, and see the, the, the people that are here and the, the, the attention uh, and the seriousness with which we take all of this, um, I find very gratifying. And I'll say to those old board members who thought I was on the wrong track and embracing this, uh, I was right and you were wrong. I <laughs> <laughs> um, want to share one quick little story. Uh, Right after the, the first Global Peace Index came out in 2007, uh, I have strong connections on the Hill, ended up being Chief of Staff for a Congressman, so know a lot of people there. So I took Steve around to meet members of Congress and, and to introduce this whole concept to them. And two things really stuck out, stuck out from, from that experience. One of them, we went to see one who had been a friend of mine. Um, and we kind of laid this out, and he said, well, you can't do that. If you put an end to war, it'll ruin the economy. And he really said that. Really said that, and he believed it. Uh, which, of course, we all know is utter and total nonsense. And I think that that, that concept has been largely destroyed, in part because this country was fighting two major wars and then had an economic collapse. And so anybody that believed that war is good for the economy certainly learned a lesson from that. No, it isn't. But this research and analysis that Steve and the Institute have done on the cost of war, demonstrating clearly and conclusively in rock solid economic terms that war is not just not good for the economy, it's dreadful for the economy. And that has, has finally permeated, and it, you just don't hear that the way we used to hear it. And that's a tribute to Steve Killalay and the work of, of this institute. <laughs> the, the other experience we had was uh, went to see Jim Moran, an old friend, a member of Congress from, from Virginia, and we were laying this out, and he, he was impressed, and he, he liked it, and he, and, he, and he kind of thought for a minute. He says, why don't we take a quarter of 1% of the military budget and put it into peace building? To which my response was, Jim, we wouldn't know what to do with that much money. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm afraid it's still true today. We still wouldn't know what to do with that much money, but, uh, but we would figure it out. That, I finished up saying, but, but we'll figure it out. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but uh, it, it gives you a perspective on the way uh, this, this whole concept and this work was, was received on the Hill. Uh, but we've done many briefings on the Hill over the years, and uh, the, the Global Peace Index, Positive Peace Index, Positive Peace concept has been introduced and is, is gradually taking hold, and people are grasping it and, and applying it. Today, of course, we had the opportunity to have Steve kind of lay the, the, the framework for us and uh, to, to recognize the, the, the overall concept and importance and the, under, the, the fact that what we're working on undergirds everything that our society is dealing with and has to deal with in the current challenging climate. I tend to be an optimist. I, I, I lecture and I've written about and give a TED talk on uh, just how, how the world has gotten better and better and better over the years, and, and it has. There's no question that it has, so we should be optimistic. And yet we face unprecedented challenges at the same time. And de being able to deal with these challenges in, in a peaceful, nonviolent way is absolutely essential, or we could 
dramatically turn in the other direction. And I think Steve has helped us grap grapple with that and recognize that and recognize the most, most appropriate ways to deal with it. We had the opportunity today to dig deep into some of, not all of the eight pillars, but, but some of the pillars to get a better understanding of, of what, what they're all about and, and how they apply and how they relate to the rest of it. Uh, looked at corruption, uh, and I, I was, was impressed with that discussion with the, the fact that it is so difficult to deal with, but it was acknowledged that, it, that at least we are now acknowledging it, acknowledging not only the reality of it, but how devastating it is, and there are some successes. Uh, um, uh, Mark was able to point out at least a few places where there is progress, and you can learn from those places where there's progress and, and apply them in, in other parts of the world. Um, I, I enjoyed the journalism thing on, on uh, solution jur journalism. I hadn't heard that term before. I probably should have, but I hadn't heard it before. Peace journalism, I've known about it for a long time. But uh, Jamil, am I, am I missing out on not, not having heard solution journalism? Well, no, we, we just found out about it recently myself. All right, I, I'm, gl I'm glad I wasn't but totally out of touch. There's a definite link between, between that and uh, yeah. you know, the work. That yeah. We've so it's. So, so it's good to be introduced to these concepts and start thinking about them and integrate them into the, the rest of the things that, that, that we do. And of course, I was pleased to see the sustainable development goals, and of course, goal 16 integrated into what we talk about, because I think it really is important for us to recognize what, what happened as a result of the Millennium Development Goals coming out of the, the year 2000. Tremendous progress that most of the world knows nothing about, you know, without, that we dramatically reduced the, the, the poverty and hunger around the world during that period of time, in part because the world community made a commitment to do that. And we did it. And I, I was in Rome in the year 2000, in 1999, and as a delegate to the World Food Com Conference, we voted whether or not to set a goal for cutting hunger in half. And I was reluctant to raise my hand as, as a vote for that. So that's way too ambitious. There's no way we're going to do that. And if we don't meet the goal, then we're going to be disappointed. We did it. We did it. Cut hunger in half throughout the planet. How many of you have seen that in the newspaper? Never. It's never there. And yet we've done it. So people get discouraged. I, I look at what we've done and say, Let's, no reason to be discouraged. Concerned, yes, about the bad things that are going on. But discouraged, no, because we have met these challenges and made tremendous progress. And now we have the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think it's really important for us to recognize the alignment between all those goals and the eight pillars of peace that we talk about here. So um, it, it's been a marvelous day for, for me and I think hope for all of the rest of you. And I want to hear from, from Ellen and Steve of what their highlights from the day are and, and anything that we can take away from it and what we might be able to do with it uh, when, when we go back to wherever we came from. So Ellen, let me turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tack and um, share five different thoughts from the day. The first is um, I'm just blown away by the ex expanding depth of this work. Um, was it two years ago we were here at Stanford? And that was a fabulously rich, wonderful day, but today we went deeper. Um, it was much more thorough. I think the panels added so much um, to the, the report, and I think that the contribution that, um, that, this, that today's effort and the report and the work of um, the Institute is really remarkable, so thank you all. It's really exciting. Um, so I one thought that was really new or one uh, panel that really caught me was Daniel Brown's talk. Um, I got my start working in a battered women's shelter when I was 19 years old. And we had a t-shirt at that time that said, World Peace Begins at Home. That was our fundraiser. Um, and I still have that t-shirt on my wall in my office. Um, and Dan Brown's talk today reminded me of that slogan because it's absolutely true. That if we look at what happens in our intimate relationships, what happens inside of us, how we deal with conflict at home, it affects how we deal with conflict in our communities and in the world. And I think he made that case really, really clearly. 
and again, put another dot in the connections that we need to make. So this is not just out there somewhere else, it's really what's happening with us. And so to that point, um, his comments about leadership were very profound, and I think we need to take them to heart and think about them very, very deeply. For the last seven years, the Compton Foundation has invested in a strategy of what we call support for transformative leadership, and that is about supporting social justice activists to have the skills of emotional intelligence, of self-care, of the ability to work across differences, the ability to have high levels of emotional intelligence. These skills are essential so that we can build a movement for social justice that comes out of love and not of anger, that knows how to deal with differences and with conflict. And we have seen through some of the work that we've funded, mostly domestically and not in the peace field necessarily, that it really does matter. And that when I look around um, the US today and see the people who are standing up and fighting, uh, not fighting, are um, offering a compelling alternative <laughs> to our current um, situation, they are people who have been through Rockwood Leadership Training or the Center for Whole Communities or other places that are teaching these kinds of skills. So I think that's a really, really important thing. And we could use that kind of um, intensive investment in the peace building world, I believe. Um, throughout the day, people raised issues of communication, of telling the story, how we talk about this work. I think we need to do more than just raise those issues. I think this is a really, really important challenge. Um, as somebody who's been involved in the social justice world for my entire professional life, it wasn't until I came to the Compton Foundation seven and a half years ago that I actually knew there was a peace movement. And I'm, I'm like a little embarrassed to tell you that, but it's really true. And like the, the focus of our program now is to make sure that people know about the work that's happening in the peace field and how critical it is to every other issue, whether it's women's equality or climate change or economic equality, peace is essential. So we have a real communications challenge and I think one of the challenges is to be able to articulate clearly a compelling vision where everybody sees themselves in that vision and in that picture. And I know some folks um, in the peace building world uh, anchored by Search and the Alliance for Peace Building are thinking about this and working on it together, but we have to do that work with much greater and deeper urgency than I think we are doing, and I think today's meeting um, really reaffirmed that uh, for me. I have a really big question, and I want to push back on something that, that Chip just said. Um, I will confess I was looking at Twitter today, um, occasionally, and a very interesting fact came out, a new report um, that quantifies the fact that $250 million a day is spent in the United States to fight the war on terror. That's a huge amount of money. And so the question that I have is not just the quantification of that, but who's benefiting? And I actually think we have an eco economic system right now that is benefiting from war. And I don't think that we have yet made the compelling case for what the transition looks like. And so I think that um, there was some discussion this, this afternoon in your panel of saying we need the economic alternatives. I think we need to actually really invest in looking at what a budget does look like. We need to have strategies that have dollar signs accounted to them and not just say 1% for peace, we don't know what to, what to spend it on. We do know what to spend it on, and we do know what it looks like, and we also need to look at the transition from people that are benefiting from a weapons economy to those who are, could benefit from a peace economy. It's very akin to what many are doing these days and looking at what the transition from a fossil fuel-based economy looks like to a clean energy, clean technology economy. We must do that work because I will posit that until we interrupt the current weapons manufacturing system, we are not going to be able to have the kind of world that we want. And then, 
And then I would be remiss if I wouldn't, if I didn't um, make as my last point the need to organize donors. Um, as a donor in the peace field, I am all too aware of a couple of things. One is there are very few of us. In the Peace and Security Funders Group here in the US, actually it's a global network, there are 60 foundations. Together we fund maybe a couple hundred million dollars of private philanthropic investment. I think the numbers from the most recent index are that about 10% of that money at this point goes to prevention. It's absolutely piss poor. And it is amazing to me how most of the donors in the Peace and Security Funders Network, and I love them, I'm on the steering <coughs> committee, um, all fund in their silos. We've got the nuclear funders, we have the Russia funders, we have the conflict intervention and atrocity prevention funders, but we don't really have a field that has a mission, a strategy, and an aligned approach to spending what little money we do have to make the kinds of changes that we want to make. And then earlier today, somebody on a panel talked about the way in which other systems of, of financing are completely mis mismatched from what we do know about where um, in investment in need to be, and I think that that work needs a, also a really clear focus of how are we going to shift the streams of investment so that it maps to, to, this, to what we know about how to build peace, and it maps to what we know about movement building to invest in that public kind of push that we need, the civil society um, call that we need for the kind of change that we want. So I think as the conference title so well put it, we need to be connecting the dots and um, make sure that the resources map to what we know um, makes a difference. Thank you. Well, it's been a uh, great day. So actually, summing it up is very, very hard, and I think Ellen just did a, uh, did a tremendous job. So I've got two pages of little short notes here from the day, and I'll just go through and hit them because they're just sort of the highlights. I think on corruption, really, we know what to do, but gee, it's really hard to change the system. It sums it up really, really well. But I think that concept of being able to involve civil society as being the change agent, I think is absolutely key. But generally, you need something within the system to align up with it, such as the prosecution department, let's say, in Brazil. Reem, Reem asked a question in the last part there on religion, and I note religion didn't come up through the day. But I'd spent the last week before coming in here in Sydney, but the four days prior to that I'd spent in Rome, two working in the Vatican, uh, with a group there which called <coughs> Ethics in Action. And it's about sort of taking a conflict and extreme poverty and then lining religion to be able to tackle those problems because that's really big in Pope Francis's uh, uh, agenda. Also, there's groups like the Religions for Peace, which I'm a trustee of, also treasure. But uh, it works on interfaith dialogue. And there's a paper we put out which is, looks at five key questions on religions and peace. So if you're interested in that, have a look at the paper. But basically, religion's neutral when it comes to conflict. And I could go into a lot more detail on that, but that's where it's at. So we look at the sustainable development goals. One of the things we did is we looked at positive peace, came back and then did an analysis of taking the 169 targets and now looking at how that came back against positive peace. And you find that there's an unequal balance through it. And that's because the sustainable development goals were the outcome of a negotiation. They weren't, didn't come from some sort of philosophical framework. So what we found is corruption. This out of the 169 targets, two indirectly referred to corruption and one directly. That one direct one is in, in uh, 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 goal 16. And so if you can't tackle corruption, it undermines every one of the other goals. So it, when looking at the sustainable development goals, that's key. The second one 
which there isn't a, isn't a lot of focus on either, is the free flow of information, particularly a free press. And again, because of the negotiations and a lot of the countries involved in it, that's not something they really want. I think Alberto, Alberto C comments about the police, that took us back to a great conversation we had about maybe a year, no, six months ago. But in the West, generally it's about 200 police per 100,000 population. In the Indigenous group he was talking about, it comes out to 800 to 900,000 per 100, eight, eight, sorry, 800 to 900 <coughs> per, per 100,000 population. So as we start to look at that, it's, and it's interesting, it's the highest numbers of police per 100,000 population are in the Western democracies. So the police quite often can be good. The question is how do you make it a positive and not a negative? I think one of the comments which really hit me, really hit me, and this comes back to systems thinking and stuff me and, me and David are working on, limited violations of encoded norms creates progress. I think Lothar said that, and like that is about systemic change because the whole systems try and stabilise and come around a homostasis so that if something's out of the norms of the system, the whole system tries to correct it. We can see it in the social conditioning around us. And if I said something outrageous, everyone in the room would try, if it was too outrageous, would correct me. So that idea of being able to have limited violation of the encoded norms to create progress through the system is key. Think of a really rigid authoritarian state. It allows no deviation of, at all. Think about the ruckusness and the noise of democracy, and that's part of the system making its gradual and limited change. So one of the other things which I think came up, government is about modifying human behaviour. Okay, so government policy is about modifying human behaviour. I think there's something really profound in that and deeply we need to look at. Out of Dan Brown, talking about psychology, with a 17 to 1 negative to positive, studies in psychology, I couldn't help think, what is the ratio when we look at peace and conflict studies? Note we've got peace before conflict, but all we're actually really studying most of the time is conflict, and that's really how I got interested in positive peace. I think the other thing coming out of that few things was we're looking at attachment and self-esteem. So I actually qualified as a psychotherapist at one stage in my 40s, just for something to do, actually. And what I, what I came at the back end of it is most modern psychology processes don't work because you get someone to talk about their problems. And the more you talk about the problems, the more the problems just run through their head. Okay? It's a bit like the tapes playing through our head. The reversal of that and getting people to now look at the positives when they're looking at self-esteem, let's say, so to correct a nasty personality, is very analogous the concepts of positive peace. If you can actually play back all the positives, the tapes in our minds start to think about that rather than our fear of violence. And I think sort of the concept of the awakening mind, I think for me, was quite profound. And that the larger person's view of life is, the more inclusive they become, and through that, more happy. I, there's something massively profound in that, and particularly as if you're building it down. Madeline Rose talked about the Global Sustainability Act. Actually, someone sent it to me two days ago. The very first line in it is the Institute for Economics and Peace estimates that the cost of violence to the global economy is $14 trillion. Then as I read down through it, a lot of it you could see coming back to positive peace. But what was more interesting is that it was two Republican senators which had proposed the bill. And so we are seeing a lot of profound change going on. On a similar note, there was a gentleman from Taiwan I met, and he was new in Taiwan to Washington, and the first thing he wanted to do when he met someone at the White House was meet the people from the National Strategy Department. Now, do you think there's a National Strategy Department? <laughs> so, if you go to Asia, you go into Japan, go into South Korea, Taiwan, the PRC, they'll all have a, stra a really big, really well-funded strategy department looking forward 20 years. Climate change is something which everyone's talking about, but my own view is that what we're going to see before climate change impacting us is a collapse of the fresh water on the planet. 
So I've done a lot of work in India and in central India around sort of collapsing water tables there. So you've got something like 600 million people sitting over a collapsing water table there now, which is down to 25% capacity and dropping. China is not much better. 400 million people live on a water table there, which is now down to 30%. When these run out, the migrations were seen, how the conflicts in the Middle East will seem like small amounts of people moving. Start to think of 100 million people on the move. And we've seen what happened in Europe and the fear in the States about migration. So that I can see being a real major issue for peace moving forward in the, f in the future. I think one thing's missing, okay? Ulysses, myself, are probably the only two people at this time in the room. Businessmen, okay? What I want you to think about is every dollar which goes in to the NGO sector, every dollar which goes in to academia has actually come about through business. Where does governments get its money from? Okay? It's from the taxation of businesses or the taxation of people who are employed by businesses which get wages. And so they're missing at the table here and you'll get a lot of talk about bringing business into the table. But the problem is in this area, we don't actually understand what the role of business really is in society. Okay? And it's a, something about the distribution of wealth. But from a perspective, we need to re envisage really what is the role of business in society. And from a view which fits with business, just hardcore money making practices in business, because that's what it's about. So I'm going to finish <coughs> now and I'll just try and give you something as a philosophical thought to take home tonight as you get into your fourth or fifth or sixth beer or Chardonnay if you're more cultured. Think about it. So if we look at the universe... So if you look at the universe today, there's something like 200 sextillion stars. So that's a one with 27 zeros after. We live in one of those solar systems. And what we're living in is a third generation sun. We, everyone in this room, is actually made up of stardust. But that stardust we've made up of is through the explosion of prior solar systems ripping themselves apart. Can anyone think of anything more violent than our solar system actually being ripped apart? If we look at the Earth today, the very sustenance of what we live in, the basis of life on the Earth, is water. That water arrived on the planet through meteorites. It wasn't naturally created in the formation of the Earth. What's more violent than meteorites smashing the planets for millions and millions and millions of years? But that's how the water arrived. And as you're sitting here today, everyone in this room to live has to eat another living creature. Can anyone imagine anything more violent than that? So the question I want you to take home is, why is there peace? <laughs> With that, <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thank you all for a wonderful, wonderful day.